say, so we have Nathan Vella and Chris Petrowski here from Super Brothers Sword nope. and Sorcery. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, and Cap uh, Capybara, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I had to mess up something at the end of it. Uh, uh, Sword and Sorcery EP, post, post mortem. It's the last session. Let's go. My fault. Sorry, I'm just making sure that I got all the like the videos and all that fun stuff just all sorted out. Uh, yep. Uh, it's gonna get hot. It's gonna get hot in here, folks. Well, we're, we're actually gonna have a we're actually gonna have a small intermission where we're gonna do jumping jacks together to wake the fuck up because yeah. this room is very conducive to everyone falling asleep, even though they might be interested or. <laughs> Maybe they're not actually interested at all. Uh, all right, so, uh, Chris, you good there, buddy? Yeah. Is your microphone on? No. <clears throat> Hello. Okie dokie. So, uh, I'm Nathan. I'm the co-founder and president of Cabby. Uh, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm the creative director and uh, co-founder of Cabby, also. And uh, since this room is mostly friends, we're not going to give any more of an intro than that. Um, so this is the this is the. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming to our party last yeah. night. Yeah, everyone. Um, so, so this is the sword and sorcery post post mortem. Uh, it's been seven months since the game has launched, so there's been enough time for us to have some like real tangible separation from the project and to actually have a bit of like clarity on um, what it was really about. Um, and so we kind of put together this talk based on that. Um, so in, instead of having like a manicured presentation where everything is about one consistent message, we just arbitrarily decided that it would be more fun and hopefully in some way more valuable to cover it from uh, different and uh, possibly even disparate perspectives um, from a whole bunch of people that were involved. This thing keeps cutting in and out. Um, so basically this talk is going to be us like mashing up like feelings and lessons and ideas and so on from a group of different people who were, you know, kind of had a role in this project, whether direct or indirect. Um, so very quickly to begin, uh, I'm going I'm to start off with an allergy, an uh, allergy, that was, <laughs> fuck. Here we go. <laughs> note to self, no parties before speaking. Um, so I have this analogy that's been in my brain for a bit, and it's an analogy about collaborations. Um, and the whole idea is that collaborations are a lot like skydiving. Um, it's, and I think it's actually one of those things that is, are really important for developers to acknowledge before they actually like take the step towards a true collaboration. So working with people is like taking your first tandem jump out of a plane. Uh, you're strapped with someone who you barely even know, um, and you hurtle towards the ground. So we were strapped to uh, Craig Adams, aka Super Brothers, who before this project we only knew through his art. And then Craig brought Jim in, uh, who neither of us knew, and we only knew Jim through his music. Um, so basically it was the equivalent to like getting an instructor and being like, this guy is in charge of your entire existence. Um, and within seconds of starting a project, you're hurtling at crazy speeds towards either safety and success or utter demise and death. Um, not to Adam Salzman's talk right there. Um, and for the most part of a project, uh, when it's collaborative, you have this like weird feeling in, this, in, in the pit of your stomach as you hurtle towards something. Um, and it, it is a lot like the idea of the feeling that you get when you're jumping out of a plane. Um, and in the end, all you can do is just hope that together you can pull the chute and land. Um, and for someone like me who wasn't directly involved in the day-to-day -day development of the game, it was still a really important kind of lesson and, and perspective of, to gain from the project. Um, now speaking of collaborations, uh, Craig can't actually be here. He's busy living in a cabin in the middle of nowhere. Um, so he's going to share a, a few words via the wonders of technology. Hi, every pony. <laughs> Super sad I'm not down there with you fine folks today. No doubt Nathan and Chris said some really smart things just now. <laughs> Thanks, guys. 
As for me, I don't have much left to say, except that this has been an amazing year, like a dream come true. For this post-postmortem, I thought it might be nice if I looped in some of the other contributors to the project. So in the last few days, I called up Jim Guthrie and a few other people that you might not have heard from before. And I put together a little clip. It's not much, but I hope you dig it. Thanks. So uh, before we, we get to listen to uh, the, the video that Craig put together, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the, the, the big takeaways, those, those real lessons kind of from my standpoint of the project that, that, I, that I've gotten to kind of learn and, and take a picture of. Okay. It's cutting out. Yeah, okay, we'll try this. Test. Better. Um, so when we were asked to do this talk, uh, I, I wrote a whole bunch of stuff. And, and, and then I didn't like it, and I wrote a whole bunch of other stuff, and I didn't like that either. And I kept coming back to this idea of like how important it was to Sword and Sorcery uh, that we started the project the right way. Um, and I'll hopefully try to explain a little bit about what that means. Um, sorcery began with two driving factors. Number one was the mutual respect between the people who were working on the project. Um, and the second was there was a real concrete desire to make something that had soul and would speak to a certain audience. Uh, Craig looped in Jim after we had started the project with Craig and his looping in Jim also was based on the mutual respect and this like hardcore desire to make something with Jim. Um, we had no financial expectations whatsoever. We kind of sat there and crossed our fingers and said, uh, I hope we make our money back. Um, and there was actually no real game concept beyond like the desire to do something that had the kind of ideas and, and used Craig's pixels and had a kind of stylistic concept. Um, so starting with this idea of like trust and desire and like hardcore deeply ingrained positivity meant that every decision we made throughout the project was guided by that. It wasn't guided by like, uh, you know, how many more sales we're gonna get or how we're gonna convince Apple to feature it. Um, in the history of Cappy, uh, we've started numerous projects for money or because they were the right fit for our studio or because we thought that a publisher might have interest in it and give us some money so we could keep going. Pretty much every one of those projects has failed. Uh, not happened, turned out kind of not as, you know, exactly what we wanted. Um, but something like Sorcery, uh, it, it really succeeded. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it started with such a positive vibe. Um, making games is really hard and there's a lot of low points and, and Chris is going to cover a bit about that as well. But when you start really high, it means that the low points aren't actually even that low. Uh, and from a pur purely like producing a game standpoint, it also means that you can kind of see through all the shit and piss of game development um, and have a real clear vision. So I built this graph here that hopefully uh, explains uh, a little bit more about what I'm talking about. So this is, this is our experience of making video games. Um, um, and they all follow the same general uh, curve, right? They start off um, in the kind of realm of, oh my god, everything's fucking amazing. Um, and then as you get deep into the guts of development, you kind of start balancing around on the line of thinking that your game sucks and you're hacks. Um, and then as the project finally comes together and you get out of that, then you come back to thinking like, wow, that was actually, this is actually really amazing. Um, the bottom red line there represents, like, it, think of it as lava that's gonna like burn the project to death. And, and, and I think a significant, like a big note is that like when you get to that point where you think your game sucks, it's teetering upon that line of killing it. Not because it's a bad project or because it's uh, you know, not going somewhere, but because you just can't help but feel the hardship of developing a project. Um, so the interesting thing about this graph is that it always stays that same, so it stays the same. It always drops down the same amount. So if you actually raise it up to like the above, oh my god, everything's fucking amazing. The distance from my game sucks and we're hacks actually increases. So starting a project with that kind of like real hardcore intense positivity, trust, you know, desire to build something is what kind of saves you during the points when your your game probably just isn't that good. 
Um, another big thing, and this is going to kind of dabble more on the, the, the business -y side, especially the business side of iOS, is that focusing on everyone means that you're not focusing on anything at all. Um, I think that iOS development, especially on the independent side, has taught people, or is actively teaching people, to make games that appeal to everyone. Um, and I know people don't like thinking about demographics and so on. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like males, age, whatever, whatever. I'm talking more about making your game for people who care about the same thing that you care about. Um, making games without thinking at all about who you want to reach means that you're not actually thinking and making intelligent decisions about your game. And I, I kind of equate this, and, 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 and I think like Cliff from Positech also talks about this a bunch as well, but would you rather have 1% of everyone or 100% of 10% of everyone. Um, and it seems like confusing math, but in the end, I would much rather have one core group of people believe in what I'm doing and gauge my success off of that than hitting a teeny tiny, itty bitty thing that really can't um, vouch for the, the feelings and ideas behind the game. Um, playing the iOS lottery means that there's a lot more failures in business, and it also means there's a lot more failures in building something of value and pushing the medium in some way. Um, like, there's a ton of iOS devices out there. Niches do exist, and they are actually explicitly looking for something that, that, that hits them right in the face. Uh, Sorcery set out with a goal to find that. We didn't know if we actually would, and I think, or I hope, that in a, in a way, Sorcery is kind of a proof of concept for the idea that you do not need to make a game for everyone on iOS. Um, and it's also another, it comes back again to the idea of guiding and how, how having guidance throughout the project, whether it's positivity or whether it's like having a real focus on who you're making the game for, it actually provides you that focus for when you tend to get lost on projects. And I'm sure everybody knows that when you're so involved in a game, there are those points in time where you do get lost and you don't necessarily know what you're even doing. Uh, lastly, small little point, and then this is kind of a like call to arms or something like that, but like open up your development and get people involved. They don't have to be collaborators. They can be contributors. And I think it's crucial that everybody in this room sit back and thinks about like, who, can, who has an idea that might be challenging to my idea and how can it make my game better? Um, so they can actually be like springboards for ideas or they can even just provide a little bit of moral support or they can actually like, provide some firepower on a piece of art or a small piece of music or a little sound effect that you didn't even know that you could actually have in your game until you started talking to them. So people like Brandon Boyer and Robert Ashley and Corey Schmitz and Scientific American and Ron Carmel and Charlene Chua and Clive Holden and Mark Rabo and even Craig's brother Mac Adams added a ton to this project without being direct collaborators. They, were, they contributed a piece, a, 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 a small little nugget of beauty within the game that actually both helped us finish the game in terms of like positive vibes but also helped us make the game better. Um, it also has this amazing fringe benefit of bringing people into the independent development community who probably wouldn't have gotten in in the first place. Um, and on that kind of subject, we're going to uh, hear some words from some contributors to this project right about now. Here we go. All right, how's it going? Good, how you doing? Good. Um, I've been making music, I guess, for, let's say, 20 years, and uh, I've done a lot of different stuff. I've made a bunch of records and played in a lot of different bands. Um, I won't go through them all or anything, but I've done lots of work, and then more recently, I've done a lot of music in film and TV, and I'm totally self-taught, and I've had lots of good opportunities, and then when the gaming thing came up, when I met you years ago, and the, uh, I really, like, everything I had done before then sort of, I think, trained me in a way I didn't really realize to do music for video games. I really think doing music for games is like the ultimate scoring uh, challenge, you know? Like a TV commercial, you sort of know how it ends. Like, I'll, I'll watch the ad a million times and it doesn't change every time I watch it, you know, it's the same ending. But with a game, you know, you don't know what the player's going to do, so... Um, that was pretty huge.
seems like you're having a good adventure. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my name is Robert Ashley. Uh, I'm the creator of A Life Well Wasted, Wasted the video game podcast. Uh, and in the band, I come to Shanghai and I'm the voice of Logfellow. And uh, basically, when Craig asked me to uh, contribute to this project, uh, I sort of figured that he would send me some lines or something. I, I don't know. He writes the most elaborately long emails I've ever seen in my life, and you don't imagine him to be someone who just leaves things up to chance. Um, <laughs> but basically, he, uh, he told me to just, you know, plug in a microphone and, and mess around with some very vague ideas, me knowing absolutely nothing about the, the game in any significant way. And I just did a voice test, rambling on some very vague things, and, and then I think I wrote wrote an email like three months later, and I was like, "Hey, man, you know, just let me know when we're gonna do the real thing, and I will, uh, and I'll hook the mic up again, and, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go for it." He was like, "Oh no, we're we're just gonna go with what you did." You know, you don't really have much to say either, uh, huh? That's cool. We can, uh, why don't we just, why don't we just enjoy the quiet? Music, I don't know, I always relate everything in life to like music and food, that's just how, just how I think, but to me like game, games have uh, a, a lot of similarities to music, like I need them to live. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there are a lot of people uh, out there these days who aren't working for the big game development farms, who are sort of free agents out there collaborating with each other. And I, you know, I read about game jams and all these conferences where you know game developers are getting together. It seems so crazy to me compared to like just ten years ago, when it all seemed extremely organized and 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 a top-down industry thing. And it just seems like there are a lot of interesting, creative people floating around, making collaborations with one another in a way that reminds me of music. And especially in these particular cities, like Toronto, strikes me as this town where. Um, at least from afar, I've never even been, but it's like a, a music scene or something. Anybody want to take a second and stand up and stretch? It's really hot in here. My talk's gonna make you fall asleep. Um, yep. So the tail end of the talk is uh, it's just me kind of talking about my uh, personal experience making sorcery, um, co-creating it with, uh, with Jim and Craig, uh, and sort of the thoughts that uh, the project left with me. Um, afterwards. I wrote it all down because whenever I get in front of a bunch of people, my brain like actually completely turns off and uh, without, you know, all my thoughts on paper, I would just stand in front of here and just like take a dump in front of you guys and <laughs> fall over. <clears throat> so, here it goes. Uh, sorcery was um, pretty much the most amazing project that I've ever worked on. Um, even though at times it was definitely uh, the most difficult as well. Um, Sorcery was actually a pretty difficult game for me. Um, I didn't really know Craig before suddenly setting out on uh, a totally unknown and insane task of making a batshit crazy game with him. 
And I have to say that even though I uh, had some games under my belt uh, going in, um, I uh, designed uh, Clash of Heroes and uh, Credit Crunch and it's a whole bucket load of totally horrendous throwaway uh, mobile games. There's a couple in there that I'm, I'm proud of, but anyway, um, I still felt kind of uh, uh, intimidated by, uh, by Craig. And the feeling didn't really go away, um, even after the project. Um, Craig is a tall, handsome man that talks real smart-like. <laughs> so, you know, it's tough. On top of that, um, I was suddenly working with, uh, with Jim, which was, uh, it was kind of mind-boggling to me uh, at the start, because before that I was a pretty huge uh, Jim Guthrie fan for many years. Um, Jim's, uh, in Toronto, he's basically a local uh, indie rock hero. He's kind of like the original people in the indie rock and roll scene. Um, and I listened to his stuff for many, many years. And then suddenly, out of the blue, I'm working on a game with him and Craig, and both of them are crazy human beings that are insanely talented. Sorcery is also a difficult project uh, for a whole other reason. Um, from the very beginning, Craig, Jim, and I decided that um, it was very important for us to make sure that the game was successful. Uh, not just as a game, but kind of more importantly to us, um, we desperately wanted to make something that was successful as an experience, um, as art, as something that was relevant to the game medium, and sort of help push it forward, uh, something that was worth people's time. And also, ideally, um, if we're lucky, something that gave people something back in return. So not just a feeling of, uh, of being a game or mastering the nuances of the game mechanics, but something to think about. Uh, some feelings to mull over, some high, some high concepts to wrap your head around, uh, and some visuals uh, to dream about. So the end goal uh, for sorcery from the very start um, we're basically completely different than any other game I've worked on. Um, that's not to say that visuals, music, and experience uh, didn't matter to previous Cappy games, but in all of our previous game uh, games, um, we definitely put mechanics um, above everything else. So this single thing, this concern with the worth of the project uh, to the players and maybe even to culture at large, um, was something that made everything a little bit harder for us that we're making worth anything at all? That question um, dumped a ton of pressure on our shoulders um, at the start, but also in a very kind of real sense, uh, it kept us focused on uh, a mostly clear goal, end goal, uh, even when literally everything else in the game was completely unknown and pretty much uh, for the majority of development a flaming pile of shit. So working with Craig and Jim um, also felt kind of unnatural at times for me. Uh, it was def uh, definitely different than my normal working relationship with Cappy folks. Um, on our projects, uh, I feel like I'm able to just work very naturally, just be excited about our games. And that's probably because they're usually uh, my game concepts to begin with. So because of that, I kind of know most of the answers to design questions as they pop up. Um, and if I don't already, then at least I know where to start, and how to approach a design problem, how to arrive at a solution that is appropriate to the project. I know the flavor of my own work, uh, and I'm able to, to quickly and confidently move forward. But none of that was true on Sorcery. I spent uh, uh, most of my time at the start second-guessing my ideas, wondering if they fit the project, wondering if they fit with Craig and Jim's goals and sensibilities. So seven months after its release, what did it actually take away from the experience of making Sword and Sorcery? The first thing, um, Nathan kind of touched on it as well, is, uh, is trust. Simple thing, but I found that working with people in a collaborative relationship changes the way you think. For me, initially, um, I had a hard time finding my place, and I found it hard to contribute the way I would like to. Uh, and it was actually, in fact, um, only after I started feeling that Craig and the project in general actually needed my help the pro uh, you know, i.e. the project was in uh, deep, deep caca, did I actually start 
feeling comfortable adding my ideas to the mix, trying to shape the project the way I saw it working out, and help Craig design and redesign and redesign pretty much every aspect of the game countless times. And with Jim's music and sound design, uh, it's almost like my natural game instincts were not allowing me to accept certain audio choices at the start. I was kind of fighting my own instincts during this project. Eventually, I think, and I think this happened to everybody involved, um, we all started to understand what sorcery was kind of trying to, to shape itself into. We eventually kind of arrived at the game um, together by mutually knowing what the game wasn't. Uh, much more, much before we knew what it, the game actually was. Um, and we trusted our ability to push the game forward and trusted each other to understand the different aspects of the game. This is on, on screen because it relaxes me. Mm. So I look to it when I'm about to freak out. Um, the second takeaway was learning how to work uh, around the obvious. So everyone in this room, I think, is to some degree um, hard-coded with traditional game mechanics. Um, those are useful things to have in your repertoire, but they're also, for the most part, um, just kind of like a bucket of easy answers. So trying to work around your gameplay instincts lets you listen to your other in instincts, and through that, create something that feels different and interesting naturally, since you're solving game issues with something other than uh, game solutions. But the most important sort of takeaway for me uh, was sort of a drastic shift in my own priorities and sensibilities. What makes a game enjoyable? What makes it worthwhile? After sorcery, at least to me, um, it's not exactly what I thought it was. A game is forever cursed by being called a game. Mechanics and dynamics after sorcery, for me, again, are uh, not the be all end all um, of the project. Uh, they're not necessarily the point. I believe that sorcery would have been just as successful, maybe even more so, if it had no puzzles or battles, uh, and if the structure wasn't as linear uh, as it is. The most amazing thing about the game is how much your mind enjoys just walking around, experiencing the world through the art, the music, and the writing. Not necessarily how much you might enjoy uh, the insanely hard Trigon battles or the three horribly obtuse uh, miracle puzzles that, that we shoved into the game. And it actually makes me kind of sad whenever I hear people say, oh yeah, I got to the, the, the battle and uh, I stopped because I couldn't you know, finish it. Uh, and because of that, they basically sort of miss out on a whole bunch of other wonderful things that, that we created, beautiful scenes and, and, and areas and things like that. Um, and those things are almost strictly there because um, we kind of felt like we had to put some sort of gameplay in the game. I kind of blame Bion for this actually, because uh, when we uh, showed the game at IGF, uh, our first build, it was just uh, the Scythian walking through the forest and, uh, and there was music, and uh, we had our, li our little IGF booth, and uh, Bion was playing it, and suddenly he, he like took off his headphones and turned to me, and in a really angry voice said, it's just walking. <laughs> and then I was like, oh no, this is bad. And then we went back home to Toronto and basically added a million other things so that it wasn't just walking. But I think it might it could have actually worked if it was just walking. Walking is awesome. Yeah. So Rich Lamarchand uh, touched on, on this during his presentation. He, uh, he showed us a scene from Uncharted 2, um, one of the moments from the game where uh, Nathan Drake walks through a beautifully crafted mountain village with nothing to do but shake hands with villagers, kick some soccer balls, crack some jokes, and take in the sights. Uh, this moment has no action, um, and it has very simple interactions, which can actually be completely ignored or avoided. Uh, and yet, this sequence became one of the most powerful moments in the game. Critics single it out as an example of the game's brilliance. It was beautiful, touching, and did wonders for, the, for Nathan's character. I already thought that Nathan Drake was, a char was charming as shit, but this moment made me feel like he was maybe even human, which is very, it's a very tough thing to do 
in a blockbuster action game where you spend quite a bit of time blasting dudes in the face. This was a non-game moment, which uh, Rich said wasn't actually easy to get into the game. There was resistance from the team and worry about its worth. It's actually nice to know that insanely brilliant studios like Naughty Dog um, also had as much, uh, as much of a hard time dropping the game mechanics torch as we did. Just letting people experience a moment. This is in hindsight, I think, one of the main reasons why Sorcery is the game that it is. Many aspects of the game, the narrative, the art, the music, the gameplay, the concepts, etc., were inspired more directly by things outside of games. Many games I love and cherish uh, are very clearly born uh, out of the love of other games. Most of the time, the games we make are in some way a riff on another game we like. We have a very sort of narcissistic relationship with our, our medium. We create games which are, by and large, mostly just the games we love. Our, explora our exploration of the games that we love. Aesthetics, music choices, and, uh, and styles, sound effect choices, etc. Many games uh, approach this from the perspective of other games first. Music could sound like music from this game. Art style is kind of a riff on that game. And of course, uh, oftentimes, uh, game mechanics, game flow, the game loop, um, these are often almost carbon copies of other games. It's not necessarily a bad thing, just something to kind of really think about. Though I had uh, uh, some difficulty syncing with Craig's sensibilities at the start, and even sometimes Jim's uh, musical or sound design choices, I am actually the reason why Jim removed the electro sax um, from the game and kept it in the LP, which is actually a choice I deeply regret because I've grown to love that moment in the soundtrack and it's totally missing from the actual game. Uh, one thing that was never an issue, even from the start, was our collective source of inspiration for everything in the game. Of course, other games were a major part of the inspiration. Out of this world, Legend of Zelda, Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, Punch-Outs, classic adventure games like Secret of Monkey Islands, The Dig, Gabriel Knight, uh, there are very, very clear nods to all of these uh, in Sorcery. But on top of that, and maybe even more importantly uh, to us, uh, we drew inspiration from the veins of film, television, books, art, music, pop culture, David Lynch, Twin Peaks, 2001 Space Odyssey, Conan the Barbarian, Ratatat, John Carpenter, The Bohemian Grove, David Icke, Carl Jung's Red Book, Sacred Geometry, Pagan Rituals, Videodrome, and even Al Jaffe's Mad Magazine Foldens. All these things were swimming around in our minds while making sorcery. We look to these things for our answers just as much, if not more, than looking for answers in other video games. This is one of the major takeaways from the experience, at least for me. Trying hard to make something that attempts to hit the notes and the depths, and reach the depths, and has the resonance of, uh, of these types of, of projects, this type of work. Something that speaks to people on a deeper level, something that isn't just interesting to gamers, but is maybe, if you're lucky, interesting and compelling to just people in general. One thing we mention on our website is that sorcery is a choice cut of myth and dreams built for the literate gamer in mind. I think most games are created for the literate gamer, or many games are. Maybe many games can be thought of as being too aimed at a literate gamer. Maybe this is what actually makes our game so inaccessible at times compared to others. Of course, the fundamental difference between games and other mediums is interaction, but interaction alone is not perhaps the real cause of the barrier to entry. The real cause maybe, possibly, is that games are being created and continue to be created by game design rules and game design sensibilities which have their roots in older games games which were created the way they were created, not necessarily because they solved the problem of the user uh, experience interaction correctly, but because they solved it at all. This is, to some degree, uh, actually the foundation that many of our games are, are built on, even today. And we still use the language tools and concepts which emerged out of, our pure, out of a purely utilitarian problem solving. Most non-game folks cannot penetrate what some of us would consider 
our most technologically advanced, most refined creations, because doing so requires a knowledge of a very specific set of totally abstract concepts, in addition to, in many cases, a physical dexterity that can only come from playing video games for 15 years. Imagine if the only way you can enjoy a work of art is to experience it while snowboarding down a mountain and shooting targets with a bow and arrow. <laughs> but this is actually sort of, you know, what we ask um, of our audience sometimes. And it's, it's I guess, no wonder that uh, many of them have a hard time taking our medium seriously. It's easier for our critics to be dismissive out of pure frustration than to learn specific skills required to simply interact with our art form before they can truly begin to experience it. I feel like maybe one of the reasons why sorcery made its way outside of the gaming press and was co covered with seriousness um, from other perspectives in uh, film magazines, music magazines, culture and tech magazines, etc., and captured a very diverse audience um, was because we approached the game from a non-traditional game perspective first. And we checked many of our ideas against those sensibilities before we resorted to our natural, kind of hard-coded gamer instincts for solutions. The result is something that is game-like, and not quite a perfect game by any means. It's, it's actually not quite a perfect anything, really. But it resonates. It gives people goosebumps. It makes people feel something for the characters in the game. I hope it even sometimes just makes people stop and listen to the sound and the music and watch the falling leaves and moving shadows. Maybe it even makes people reconnect with the moon cycle, remember that it even exists and that our life on this planet has been linked to it for much longer than not, and our beliefs and understanding of ourselves were directly influenced by it. Maybe it leaves you with a little bit of magic pixie dust on your ride home on the subway, um, or maybe you can go for a walk in the park with sorcery goggles on, looking for sprites and pond and mushrooms under a tree. But none of these things um, have anything to do with gameplay whatsoever. Or game mechanics. They have everything to do with interaction and experience. And this is something that we all try to do well and try, and is something that has become much more important to me as a game designer after sorcery. What you can give to a player, a person, outside of the exploration of a mechanic is fill their minds and hearts with pure sorcery. That's what, more than anything else, video games do. Ultimately on a level that no other medium can ever hope to reach. Video games are pure fucking sorcery. That's what they felt like when you first started interacting with them as a kid. They are magic spaces that have the power to draw people into them rather than scare people away from them. When we view our audience as players, we automatically make an assumption about their ability to penetrate our, cre our creation. The word player makes an assumption about skill. It's also an inclusive term. Your game is made for players. If your game is made for players, it probably not, it's probably not made for anybody else. This indicate has been incredibly inspiring for me. Uh, and many of the things I mentioned have already been covered in other, uh, by other presenters. Um, Rich delivered a much better talk about uh, the experiential nature of our medium, and he also did it with a cool accent, um, and in greater depth. And there's nothing more inspiring than the collection of games at this conference. It is proof that, more than anything, that we as game makers are coming to the same conclusions together. And we want more from our beloved medium. Maybe we're approaching a moment where game mechanics are not the main point of the conversation we're having with the player. Maybe we can stop trying to force meaning out of mechanics in a way that often feels crude and, uh, and wrong. During Robin's uh, EGS session about collaboration, um, Eric Zimmerman said something that immediately resonated with me, a simple perspective change that may help us shift our relationship with our audience. When discussing 16 Tons, a game made in collaboration with Natalie Posey, <laughs> he referred to his audience, uh, to the audience as, instead of as players, he referred to them as visitors in space. The simple shift changes many things. 
welcome your visitors, show them your hospitality, play with and to their senses. Thanks. up a little bit and people can ask questions as the slide says. We're trying to figure out where the lights are, but I'm going to open the door. <laughs> yeah, we'll do their work in the uh, Okay. Uh, there we go. Lights. Hey, a question about the difference between collaboration and contribution. Go with that a little more. Um, like I think collaboration, at least from my own personal or experience, is like sitting down to start and finish a project with someone. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be there the whole time, but you need to be the person who's, who's actually directly responsible for creating a part of the project, sound, art, whatever. Um, whereas contribution could be like, you know, Brandon talking to Craig about a weird idea about putting a, you know, a listening booth in the game and that actually resonating with Craig and Chris and then that actually making it into the game. Or even something as simple as like Mark Rabo from Toronto shooting a video uh, of Jim to kind of like launch alongside the, uh, the Sorcery LP. Um, and just even the vision that he had in that one little piece really kind of like helped us understand how we were talking about the LP just to people who were interested in the music. But did you go out and seek those contributions or was it just like happened in a conversation or just, you know? Uh, this on? No. I think it was a combination of both. I think um, I think just to elaborate on the answer, I think it might be uh, uh, the main difference might be just kind of scale, basically. Um, and I think the other thing is that a lot of times with the sort of contributions, we weren't really sure what we were going to do with them. It was kind of just like, hey, can you give us some stuff um, because we want you to be involved in some way. Um, and and then afterwards, sometimes ideas would be kind of born out of what we <coughs> arrived at, what, what we were given, basically. So, whereas I think a collaborator is someone probably that you're, you know, more closely working with all the time. It's like some, it's someone that you set out to do something with, almost like to f to complete something with. Exactly. This is on, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Others. Uh, it was a question for Chris, I think. Uh, as part of takeaway one, you said that you found yourself <coughs> fighting your instincts. Do you have an example, or do you remember uh, the time when that was the case? Uh, yeah, um, one of the early examples was um, for those guys, for, for those of you who played the game, one of the first things, sort of the first things that the player is asked to do, as far as, you know, you know, loosely gameplay is concerned, is, is cross the, uh, the chasm. Uh, and enter the sort of uh, Mickey Talk Mountain. Um, and we redesigned that kind of, that puzzle there multiple times. Um, the first sort of versions of that puzzle were much more um, complicated uh, and required sort of multiple steps to like, you had to find, you had to hit like this chime in a different screen and then uh, that would create this like little melody and then if you ate a mushroom while listening to that melody, your character would float on a certain note and then that would let you like float up to grab a key and then you'd arrive there and then use the key. And then, you know, and those were in there because it kind of felt like we needed to create this sort of, you know, you, you go on this long walk for the first 10 minutes and then we really kind of felt like, okay, now we have to let the player walk around and do things that solve something kind of more game-like. And then eventually we really sort of stripped it down to something that, um, maybe wasn't as satisfying to someone who likes solving adventure puzzles, but felt a lot more natural for, uh, for the actual game. So um, that would be one specific case, yeah. We have time for one more question. Um, in terms of gameplay versus meditative exploration, uh, there's sort of groups that are I feel like they're almost kind of this inverse relationship and I started with you know, this game where you know, you're facing a player who kind of lose being asked in a certain moment to be meditated, uh, you know, to explore. Whereas in sorcery, you have mostly exploration and then these like, sort of spikes of uh, more gameplay and play. And to keep on the line, do you think that has to be more of the player or is that more difficult? 
do I think that sorcery is asking more of the player? Yeah, or do you like in terms of reaction to the player, harder harder transition? Harder transition? I, I think it might be asking more of their attention span. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's more difficult or anything like that. Um, I think you do kind of run the risk that someone will just think what you, you know, what you created is, is sort of boring. And I think it's sort of, it might be a little bit easier or not easier, but it, it feels like it's a little bit more uh, comfortable and, uh, and measurable if you can actually craft a, a moment that has, uh, you know, very clear uh, action or, 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 you know, very clear things that players have to do, uh, and you can sort of gauge uh, the success of that kind of uh, scene, I think, a little bit better than something that's like, well, I hope people enjoy the walk up this mountain. You know, you, you can't really tell whether that is, is, is actually good, yeah. so, it's you know, but I think you can actually, you can to a certain degree through playtesting other things, actually know whether that sequence of amazingly choreographed action works. Yeah, it's, all, so. it's you can't focus test an experience. You can focus test uh, a moment, um, and that's I mean even just watching people play that. I mean my experience with the game was very interesting because my involved I was never directly involved in the day to day, so I could actually come in at a certain point and play it kind of from a semi fresh perspective, um, and you know I was kind of almost like a weird litmus test in a lot of ways because I wanted to be involved. I wanted to have an experience. And that was almost the way that we kind of had to approach it rather than like go out and, and find a whole bunch of people to prove that this like really exciting thing was actually really exciting. So I do that, like, I mean, from at least my personal opinion is I do think it's kind of like, it, it does ask more because it is kind of like, rather than just like action, 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 pause, like that's kind of very similar to a lot of other, um, like, an action movie or like a really kind of cheesy fantasy novel or something we've all kind of consumed that i don't think as often we consume stuff that's, that's like ask you to like stay super mellow and then shoot up to do something intense it's like you're you're because of that clip it's like you're 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 like you're like almost like you're like you're It's like come in and the first thing you do is take a nap rather than like come in and, you know. Yeah, with a, a laser beam from uh, Sacred Geometry. <laughs> cool, thank, thanks folks. Here's the thank you.